talk with Lady Going Ali. It's my pleasure to be here this uh, Sunday evening. Thank you very much uh, in case you're joining me or you might be joining me on YouTube or LinkedIn, any other platform. Every now and then I get to come on this uh, platform, you know, to discuss issues, to discuss, um, you know, trending issues, health issues, um, things that empowers, you know, our youth or individuals. So that's basically, you know, just a second. That's basically what uh, Let's Talk with Lady Gwen is about. Not just, uh, we focus on so many things, so many things. It's all about empowerment of the mind. And it's my pleasure to be right here. I see everybody and I say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the newlywed, uh, honorable, um, now remind me, <laughs> you're rushing along. All right, I see you. Congratulations once again. All right, so um, today I will be talking to Dr. David Oway. Dr. David Oway is a medical doctor, uh, a sickle cell warrior, an advocate. He's an author and so many more, uh, you know, that's probably... I don't even know about so I will be talking to him just in a bit but as um, you might know or you might have forgotten that September is you know a month to create awareness in terms of sickle cell yes Michael sorry forgive me Michael in terms of down below I see you transparency speaks I see you um, Purple Bloom uh, Publishers, I see you as well. Thank you all for joining me. <laughs> all right, so uh, September is a time for us to create awareness. I know we also have, you know, it's a month for environmental uh, preservation or, you know, pre preservative of waste, you know, and, um, but then today I am taking a focus and a look at sickle cell. Why are those cells sickled? why what happens to a sufferer you know what happens why you begin to wonder what what life holds do we discriminate you know sometimes people say don't marry someone who is sickle uh, who's with a with a sickler um you know and all of so we, we're just going to get some information and it's really very important that you sit tight and sit back, you know, for us to have this conversation. I'm also believing, um, you know, something that would will bring a smooth flow, okay, because of internet. I think it's it's looking better today. All right, Dr. Oweye, are you with me? Yes, I'm with you. Can you hear me? Good evening. Yes, good evening, loud and clear. Uh, and it's it's really you know promising today compared to the other time we tried to do this yeah yeah it's better today thank god i'm telling you thanks be to god <laughs> okay you know i know you have a book i know you have a book first of all tell me about that book you know be before i get to also talk about you you know, your challenges, your advocacy, and all of that, the things you've had to do for yourself and for other people. Tell me about the book, first of all. Okay, uh, the book, I have published three books, or two.
people know that I was going to be able to Oh my goodness okay that that was from my end right yes yes but i hope you can hear me or do you want me to come yeah, in yes yes my my i think my internet because i'm rotating from two devices or two uh internet providers so i guess it was trying to change to the other one so please pardon me go ahead okay do you want me to come again because i was able to explain what you wanted but do you want me to come again and Say yes, I, 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 I did. Um, I got all the all the uh, narrative about you trying to you going through some challenges before 2020, and and never you never for once thought you were going to publish a book. And then a friend of yours, you know, um, God used him to speak to you, you know, about sharing your your um, your knowledge and all of that, and. I got all of that, but let me ask you, you talked about some challenging moment, I think in 2019. Would you like to share some of those things? Are there some things you can share with us? Okay, uh, so I, mean, though I may not be able to share some because of my privacy. No, that, that's fine. Was having that's... Challenges. Uh, at the place of work, I was having challenges, uh, marital challenges, my health, but that period, I had been going through some challenges with uh, chronic fatigue. There is this condition that sickle cell disorder causes, chronic fatigue syndrome. It is not only caused by sickle cell disorder. Uh, CDC has been able to classify it as a condition that has some characteristic inclusive criteria. And one of those inclusive criteria is uh, chronic fatigue that does not get resolved after sleeping or after resting. So it's like you rest, wow. you feel very tired, so you go to sleep. Maybe two hours, four hours, you wake up and you feel weaker. And then you are like confused. What is going on? And then outside that, there is this um, migraine-like headache that it causes whereby on one right side of the head, either the left or the right, you could have that migraine-like headache. And then the, there's an artery in that area called superficial temporal artery. Now, if you see my right, left side, you will see this artery. Uh, which is uh, palpable, pulsating, and it's obvious. Well, I've been having headaches since morning. So that artery will be pulsating and will be bulging out. Uh, that's like migraine-like headache that it causes. Then another inclusive criteria is um, memory loss, short-term memory loss. Uh, yeah. I also experienced that. Another inclusive criteria is um, depression. In uh, 2019, I started uh, medication on depression after seeing the psychiatrist. Another one is myalgia, you'll be having muscle pains. Another one is polyarthralgia, you'll be having joint pains at different points of the joint. Uh, another one is, um, uh, when I remember, I'll try, I'll try and mention it. So these are some of the characteristics of chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, prior to that, like almost three years before then, I've been having this chronic fatigue syndrome, but I didn't even know what it was about. Then also within that period, I started having another condition that occurs in sickle cell disorder, not only sickle cell disorder actually, it's called um, chronic pain syndrome. In chronic pain syndrome, we are, as people with sickle cell disorder, we are having pain crisis at least three days in a week. So I was having that challenge. There was a time, okay, when I was having a chronic fatigue syndrome, I normally, I'm this kind of person that multitasks. I like to do a lot of things at the same time. So uh, I, that was like almost five years ago, but four or five years ago, I woke up on the weekend and I did outline the things I wanted to do, do the laundry, cook, uh, read, take care of the house and all those stuff. And so after doing the laundry, or while in the process of doing the laundry, which was the first thing I could do, I started feeling very weak and fired. Oh. I said I was going to faint. But I felt, no, no, no. I, I thought initially when it was happening that this was procrastination, but I didn't even know that this is chronic fatigue syndrome and this is how the chronic fatigue occurs. So I was trying to like refuse it and kept doing what I was doing. 
all of a sudden it uh, triggered the pain crisis and I had started having pain crisis. Now, the best way I can describe the pain crisis now is when I use a woman in labor. Well, as a woman, while I believe you've had um, children, while you are having labor pain, at that period of active labor pain, when the service, medically speaking, the service was fully dilated, you're having like four contractions in 10 mm. minutes, and each contraction was lasting for two minutes. Within that period, when you're having that kind of contraction, that kind of pain you're having, is that labor pain is also described as the kind of pain we have in pain crisis. So at times you can have it for minutes, you can have it for hours, you can have it for days, you can have it for weeks. So suddenly that pain crisis started, and then I could not just do anything again. I had to go and rest. Now, I went to prepare tea to drink, and in the process, when the pain crisis started, all my body started shaking, including my fingernails. And so as I was carrying the cup of tea, it poured on my body. But I did not feel oh the pain God. of the hot tea. Wow. Because the pain of the cry, pain crisis was worse than that. So I had to go and sit down and just calm down till the pain crisis left. So those are part of the challenges I had experiencing chronic uh, pain syndrome. So those are part of the challenges I had in 2019. And so I was like, what is all this? What is all this? And that was why my friends make that statement. Now, prior to that, like almost 15 years, well, I was in medical, 15 years ago when I was in medical school, God made that same exact statement to me. He said, David, there are some things that will make you pass through in this life, not because of you, but because of people I'll bring you in contact with in the future. So when my friend said that, I was like, how can he make that same statement? So I started searching within me and what is wrong, what is going on. So I recall, reflected on some of the past experiences. But prior to this, I was not engaged in sickle cell advocacy. Uh, while I was growing up as a teenager and I was looking for a solution to sickle cell disorder, uh, going for crusade, prayer and fasting, deliverance, and all of those stuff, have concussion. At a particular time, uh, my wow. parents invited somebody who made incision marks on my body, and he said, when the blood comes out, the bad blood will come. So I tried a lot of things. Nothing worked. And then God told me. There was a time I fasted, and I said, I, won't go, I, was not, I locked myself in the room. I was a teenager then, teenager. And I said, I was not going to come out until Jesus come and appear to me and take away the crisis and the sickle cell disorder. And after 24 hours, I stayed indoor fasting. Jesus did not come. My parents had to call my pastor, so my uncle is a reverend with Rema Chapel, and come and talk to him. So that was how I was able to come out. So later on, I was a teenager. God told me, I'm not going to heal you from sickle cell disorder. Rather, I'm going to use sickle cell disorder to glorify my name in your life. And yes. so I didn't understand what that meant because I felt, how can infirmity glorify God's name? What I understood as a teenager then was to say, you go for crusade, somebody have a sickness, and then he's healed, and he gives a testimony. So that's what I understood. So how infirmity can glorify God, I didn't understand that. So, uh, okay, I felt maybe God meant I was not going to be having a crisis and complications. And so if people ask me, do you have sickness and disorder? I would tell them yes, but I don't have a crisis and complications. But that was not what God meant, because I was frequently having crises and complications. So I was angry. I was not happy. And so I turned back against it. Literally, like, you know, when Jonah disobeyed God, it was like, I just turned my back on that. So throughout those periods, I was never involved in anything about advocacy. I shy away from being talking about school studies. So that I tried to live in self-denial. I never had to talk about it. So within that 2019, I started evaluating a lot of things. It was in 2020, late 2020 or 2010, and 2021, that God brought back to my mind those things that happened in the past. And I had to submit to God that, okay, God, I'm sorry. I'm ready to do it. I will give myself and commit myself to it. And God showed me something that happened in the past some opportunities that I missed. So in 2019, when I was going through those challenges, I now wrote about, I, pub, I published on social media, my experience with, uh, was it chronic leg ulcer? That was the first time I was going to publish uh, any of my sickle cell experiences online. And I saw a lot of responses from people, people saying, oh, they don't even know that this is caused by sickle cell disorder. So that was when I knew, oh, I had to start doing that. So I started publishing some of my experiences on social media. So 2020, during COVID-19, God just told me, some things I've been writing in the past when I was doing research and reading about sickle cell, I should start writing about it to publish the book. And to God be the glory, September 2020, the book came out. Wonderful. Oh, my goodness. You know, I, I think it's, it's necessary for one to, to connect with this narrative. Because I hear... I hear point of depression coming out of depression or fighting mental health 
uh, not just with sickle cell, but also, you know, getting her out of depression. And I think, I think the moment we understand again, you know, that there are some sicknesses, they are not, they are not uh, stronger than the power of God, and they, they might not be a total cure. But it is for God to use it as a demonstration of his power. I hear that in your narrative. And it's very essential. I remember I had a friend who he got paralyzed while, while going to school. OAU for, um, you know, back then. And he got paralyzed and he's on the wheelchair, you know. And the paralysis is so bad that all he can just do is um, sit up and he's mostly lying down on the bed. He, he mostly lies down, you know, either on his tummy or on his back. So most of the time he has bed sore and all of that, you know, and he's full of life. I remember in 2020, 2020, okay, 2020, 2021, when I visited him, his skin or his body, his flesh wasn't healing, didn't have the power to heal. And he said to me that at some point it felt like dying. But I tell you today he's healed. He said at one point in time in his life he was believing God for total healing, where he will walk again. But until the revelation came that, hey, you're not going to walk, but you are going to, from this wheelchair, from all your circumstances, I'm going to use it to change lives. And sincerely speaking, this guy is doing great. Yes, he has his challenges, ups and downs, but he challenges many lives and many so. And I, I, I just love your story. It is transformational. And I thank God that you've yielded to the call to submit yourself to to en enabling other people, to empowering other people. Um, I I'm really so moved by, by your, by your, you know, by your narrative. Now, I, I like to ask, how did you know that you were sickle cell, you know, sufferer, maybe from childbirth or something? How did that come up? Okay, uh, my mom is a nurse, retired nurse. Uh, so, being a nurse, she was able to know right from childhood, uh, maybe at least as long as I could know things, I got to know. And then, but you know, there was little limited information about it then in the past. In fact, I, uh, there are some things, okay, there are an experience my mom told me when I was growing up. I didn't even know about it. That was the first time, according to her, I had blood transfusion and I was admitted in the hospital. Okay, it happened like this. We are having a uh, night devotion, praying and then having night devotion. And so, we, we, there is this um, um, daily uh, devotion that we used to use then. And then the question came up from the daily devotion for that night that um, uh, how many of you have been hospitalized before? How many of you have received blood before? If you have not, you have a reason to thank God. So uh, that question was thrown to all of us, my, my seven siblings. And everybody was saying none of us, none of us. And then my, I also said none of us. Then I that no, I have not heard it before. And my mom said, You, you were who, as in, you know, Yoruba, of all people, you. And then she narrated an experience I had when I was young. Uh, maybe I was less than five, maybe I was two years old or three years old. I, was, I, was, I slept suddenly and I woke up in the middle of the night. There were sores all over my legs and my lungs. And then I was admitted in the hospital. I was transfused with at least, at least five pints of blood was in the hospital for almost a week. In fact, they thought I was going to die. Some people had already given up. And but my mom, after walking, closing from her shift to come back and meet me, she would take care of me. And people, even the nurses at that point, abandoned me because they felt I was just going to die. I was never going to make it. And so my mom would come, take care of the soil bed, came in, clean, me up, clean me up and all those stuff. Because she just believed. So she shared that experience. Later on, while I started learning about school said so that, I've got to understand that probably that was hand and foot syndrome. Uh, hand and foot syndrome of course in chiku, sick people with sickle cell disorder, especially in children, whereby the ankles and the uh, the, uh, the ankles and the wrist joints are swollen. And then there could be sores coming out from that. So that was what I had and could lead to hospitalization, blood transition and many other problems. So 
that was the experience I had, and I, that's how I got to know. So there are a lot of things that I did not know, like um, bedwetting. I bedwet till after the age of 10 years. And then I never, you know, I had this psychological trauma experience with it because uh, what was prevalent in the community then was what the notion, the idea people had about bedwetting. And so that was some of those things that my, my parents did practicalize. Oh, when a child bedwets and you allow him or her to wash his beddings outside, uh, it will bring that shame that will make him stop bedwetting, but none of those things work. Oh, yes. if you stop eating once it's 6 p.m. so that he will not drink any water, none of those things work. And I kept bedwetting. So it was later on I got to realize, well, I was reading about school said that sickle said disorder causes bedwetting, nocturnal enuresis. Even Pika, I was eating sand till after secondary school. And I never knew until later on I got to understand that Pika eating inordinate substances uh, non-nutritional substance is also called by school study disorder. So when I published it online, I saw many people responding from different parts of the world that they are eating foam adults, that they are still eating chalk, uh, sand, uh, ash, uh, charcoal, and all those stuffs. So yes. all this information, yeah, makes you understand when you share the information. Two things that God made me understand about my experience is that I will use my experience to inform people, and I will use my experience to inspire people. So. Whenever I have to talk truthfully about my experiences, be it I had chronic leg ulcer, whereby the leg ulcer lasted for six months each, and I had it twice. I had uh, priapism, whereby there is a uh, prolonged penile erection that is very painful. The penile organ becomes erected, very painful, and then gets prolonged for a long time, and it's purposeless. It's not because of wet dreams, it's not because of sexual erosa. The first time I had it was in 500 level, and I had to go and read about it from the medical textbook, and I said, well, oh, so said, so that is what I had. So I have to talk about it truthfully to inform people, and then I have to inspire people about it. Now, the aspect of inspiring people is that going through some of these challenges, I could choose to be a victim. And like, oh, when I talk about my story, people are despondent, people are depressed, people are sad. Or when I talk about my story, I choose to be a victim. Make people understand that the presence of sickle cell disorder in my life is not the absence of God in my life, and that by the grace of God, there are no limitations in life except for the things we limit ourselves. And so I can do all things because whether sickle cell disorder or not, God is strengthening me to do it. So. I choose to inform and inspire people with this challenge because I believe that is what God wants me to do. Right. Fantastic. Fantastic. This is this is awesome life experience. And sometimes you know you think you're going through something, but well you you need to hear other people's story. And then you begin to tell yourself, no, you know what what I'm going through is is nothing, you know, compared to what this other person is going through. And it's really so amazing how God has brought you through all of that. I heard about people eating um, you know, crazy stuff, chalk. Um, charcoal, sand, but I've never come across one. I mean, someone I've heard of it. I've 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 read articles about it. I know about it, but never have I met someone who who would say, "Oh, I I do eat sand. I do eat charcoal. I do." You know, it's really unimaginable, unimaginable, really. And I, I like to ask, you know, at this point. What causes sickle cell in the first place? Now, um, there are limited information currently about sickle cell disorder, which I believe uh, by, we are, there is need for more research. So by talking about our experiences, it will make people do more research, be able to understand it. Uh, there are just hypotheses uh, about it, because a sickle cell disorder occurs when the red blood cell the hemoglobin in it becomes sickled, the red blood cell becomes sickled, and then it blocks blood circulation. So any part of the body where blood circulation gets to, that sickled red blood cell can block the blood circulation, be it in the brain. So there's this hypothesis that uh, the brain function, one way or the other, is compromised because of those sickled red blood cells that blocks blood circulation to the brain. But they are just hypotheses which needs more research. So that is one of the reasons why we talk about it create awareness about it so that more research can be put into sickle cell disorder be able to help us understand. In fact, sickle cell disorder was the first genetic disorder that was classified as a metabolic disorder in the world, but it's the least funded and least researched in the world. 
So when we keep talking about it, it will make uh, the medical community and medical experts and medical organizations like WHO, CDC, and the rest to contribute more resources to research what causes this. There are, there are many hypotheses that but not uh, concrete information to know why PICA is associated with sickle cell disorder, why uh, enuresis, bedwetting is associated with sickle cell disorder, uh, why many other conditions, even chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic peak syndrome, you know, all of these things are associated with sickle cell disorder. So, in fact, some, some of these conditions, it is our experiencing that is, experiences that is enlightening the world. Uh, when I yes. was, there's this other condition I'm battling with uh, called, um, uh, when I did, uh, causes chronic lower back pain. So I've been having like chronic lower back pain for almost two years, one year and a half. So I went to see the neurosurgeon, this um, CT scan of the back, MRI of the back, and then the neurosurgeon detected that I have a condition called early spondylogenerative changes of the vertebra, the fifth lumbar vertebral and the fourth stacker vertebra. And I asked the neurosurgeon, does sickle cell disorder causes this? And he said, no. I met another neurosurgeon, I also asked him and he said, no. But when I spoke with my hematologist, she said, yes, that sickle cell disorder causes it. And age also causes it. So these are the two conditions. And when I was describing to her that, oh, whenever it can trigger a pain crisis, she said, yes, that it can trigger a pain crisis and then the pain crisis can also trigger it. So it is our experience that is enlightening the people, even the medical community has that because some hematologists that I've met and other health workers, they don't even understand it. And they, don't, they cannot associate with sickle cell disorder. Because I was able to meet one or two that I said, okay, yes, because maybe probably they've met others, or they have been able to study further into it. So when we talk about it, we are creating an avenue for the world to know how sickle cell disorder is. So that it can help to eliminate the myths, because there are so many myths about it. It can help to eliminate the misconceptions and the misinformation. You still not believe that in the 21st century there are people uh, that holds religious beliefs and cultural beliefs about sickle cell disorder, uh, that you are demon possessed if you have sickle cell disorder. I've had people who their parents have to stop from going to school because they felt sponsoring their education was just like a waste of their resources. So they stopped them from going to school. And every other sibling was allowed to go to school except the person. So, you, and, because, and the reason they did that is because they religious uh, uh the clergyman told them that the, the person was demon uh, the person was a source of waste to their family's finances and so they had to stop the person's going to school so there are a lot of people that carry these myths about school said disorder and i believe when we share our experiences about it it will make them understand that uh this is not what it is and then eliminate those myths misconceptions and misinformation about it and then to make them stop the discrimination that they attach or they put against sickle cell warriors in the family, in the school, in the work environment, and in the community. Right. Okay. Um, I see your doctor, uh, Adesha Dole. He said she said a very inspirational, informative, and inspiring narrative. Thank you, Doctor Way. Now I'd like to ask you. Let's talk about some of those myths. You know, you you've shared a part of it. I remember that you know people people will say abiku. You know, I, I want to believe that this way probably children with traits of sickle cell and back pain, you know, and let's talk about some of this myth. How do we, what are they? And how do we eradicate the misconception? Okay, uh, in my book, Life with Sickle Cell Disorder, I did some wider reading and I put information about some of the myths. Uh, sickle Cell Disorder was first noticed unscientifically in 1670 from a Ghanaian family. Now in 1870, unscientifically, it was identified in African medical literature or journals as Obanji. And then some also people also associated with it Abiku, whereby children under the ages of five years old, once children do not uh, die frequently, they don't reach five years old, they don't get to celebrate their fifth year when they will have died. And so because there were little information about sickle cell disorder and medical information available, they were limited. They did not know. Then the, for the first scientific data to be able to show that there's something called sickle cell, that was in 1904. It, it was uh, detected in a, in a patient, a medical a dentist student, a student studied dentistry in um, Greenland Island in the Chicago in the Presbyterian Hospital called Walter Clement Noel. In 1904, he was presented in the hospital and the doctor that managed him, Dr. Eric, discovered some changes in his blood 
which were still clean, which you've never discovered before. But before then, there were a lot of things that were not properly documented, but were all were documented, but they were not uh, narrated scientifically. And so, based on the information we have now, we're able to trace that probably some of those cases of abiku were due to sickle cell disorder. Because when information and the medical knowledge and um, medical treatment or management for sickle cell disorder were limited, it was difficult for people that were having sickle cell disorder to live beyond five years old. So also malaria, uh, people that were have children that were having malaria in malaria endemic places were not living up to their fifth year. Those conditions were also associated to malaria. And there's also this uh, hypothesis that uh, malaria occurrences occur in uh, regions where sickle cell were predominant in the past. So people, there is this concept of migration whereby people migrating, uh, then those areas where malaria a migration occurred, where there is malaria associated with sickle cell disorder as well. And those places had a lot of children not living up to their fifth birthday. They were dying. So there were a lot of unscientific information or documents that highlighted that some of these things were caused due to sickle cell disorder. So unfortunately, people carry this myth. One, that uh, it is um, a, a demonic possession. Somebody is demon possessed when they have sickle cell disorder. Some people think sickle cell disorder can come due to an infection. You are infected. Sickle cell disorder is not an infectious disease. So you cannot be infected like uh, HIV, like COVID-19, like malaria, or chest, or any other forms of infection. It is, not, it is a non-infectious disease, a non-communicable disease. Some people also have this condition that uh, myths or misinformation about sickle cell disorder that um, uh, when you are complaining, when you have pain crisis and you present in the hospital, until they, if they don't see you wailing or shouting, they don't believe that you're having yeah. excruciating pain. But with time, you've got, when you've experienced it frequently, you've got to understand that your wailing or shouting does not change the pain. Yeah. So, in fact, you need to conserve the energy because you don't know. For you with sickle cell disorder, uh, sickle cell anemia, uh, before you can go to the hospital to go and present with a pain crisis, you will have tried a lot of things at home. And none of it will have worked. So you might have stayed at home for hours or a day or more. And the pain has consisted and has not stopped. And that's when you just felt, I think I need to go to the hospital. And you go to the hospital. You've exhausted all resources. You've, you are exhausted, tired. And so there's no more energy in you. So which energy do you have to be shouting and willing you don't have? The energy you have is just to conserve it and be able to narrate what you are going through with the doctor. But you see, when some of the etiquettes see you not shouting, not willing like a woman in labor, or somebody with a uh, fracture, bone fracture, or somebody with other causes of acute pain. And they they like, no, no, you are not serious. And they tell you, you are not having that kind of pain you are describing. But you don't have energy to shout. So you just keep quiet because you are so, so tired. Shouting the more can worsen the pain or can prolong the pain. So you don't even have that energy. And so they don't give you prompt treatment because they are not seeing you having the gymnasium that demonstrates somebody with that kind of pain you are describing. So those are part of the myths or misinformation that people still carry, even health workers carry about sickle cell disorder. And even with chronic fatigue syndrome, when you talk, I've had we discuss with people with chronic fatigue syndrome that have sickle cell disorder from different parts of the world. And there's this description that even when you talk to health workers, general practitioners, you talk to your, uh, your uh, hematologist or other specialists, and you are describing that chronic fatigue, the way it occurs, they, they quickly tell you that, yes, chronic fatigue occurs in sickle cell disorder because of the frequent breakdown of red blood cell. But this is totally different. Because the one that occurs with frequent breakdown of red blood cell, once you rest or you take, you eat or you probably you need to be transferred, transfused, it goes. This one doesn't go with any of those things. It just continues. So you are trying to describe it, and at times you are like, maybe they don't take you seriously. Now, this chronic fatigue syndrome also has been highlighted in people with COVID as a complication of COVID, or they describe it as a post-COVID condition. And I have had people with it describing that when they describe the way it occurs, the medical practitioners do not believe them. They think they are lying. The same way they treat people with COVID that are having chronic fatigue syndrome is the same way they've been treating them. So when I had it, I was like, this is the same thing we are experiencing. But unfortunately, it's as if the medical community of the world is not putting focus on it. Maybe if they had been able to listen to people with sickle cell disorder describing chronic fatigue syndrome, because chronic fatigue syndrome has not been, it's not a new thing. It's just like many people have not been talking about it. 
because they were tired. They've spoken about it even to their family members and nobody believes them. And you just keep quiet. I understand it because I also, at the point on time, describe it to my family members, describe it to friends, describe it to colleagues and people like they don't, they think you are crazy or they don't believe you. So you just keep quiet because it takes so much of energy. It takes so much of confidence. You try and gather courage for a long time, for months to be able to speak about it. And you speak about it and people are like, are you serious? Are you just all oh, people are tired, lagging you that oh maybe you are just lazy. Because when that chronic fatigue, of course, you seem lazy. I remember there was a time when I was at home in Nigeria and I was having that chronic fatigue and my children wanted me to follow them to the uh lawn, lawn tennis courts so that they can go and play long tennis on, on the weekend. And so I woke up and I was having that chronic fatigue and I told them, Oh, please, then I didn't even understand it was what I was having. And so I told them, let me rest for two hours, that I, an hour, and then I'll follow you. After an hour of resting, my son came back to call me. Daddy, it's time to go. And I, and I woke up and I felt weaker. And I told him, ah, please, let me rest more. And he said, oh, Daddy, maybe you just don't want to go with us. I just kept quiet because I didn't know what to say. And, you know, if people cannot understand it because I'm waking up and I feel weaker. And like, are you, are you all right? Or maybe you're just lying. And so when I hear people describing it with people with COVID-19 describing it, I'm like, that's the same way we've been having it. And we've been talking about it, but maybe, maybe now the medical community will be able to concentrate more research into it to help us because if you go to check online or from medical journals, there is hardly more information about how to be able to diagnose it. They'll just tell you the inclusive criteria. Then there's no information about how to manage it. There are just many hypotheses, which are both uh, orthodox and non-orthodox. And there's this challenge that the orthodox medicine is not accepting the unorthodox methods. One of some of those unorthodox methods is uh, grounding. One of them is grounding. You walk on, you walk barefooted on the grass for 30 minutes. You can do that every day. And then they've been able to notice that people that have it have done it for months, and they were having, they are getting better. Another thing that they prescribed was God watching. Early in the morning, you go and watch the board. And so they see that, oh, these are people that have tried this for months. We are getting better. They are feeling better. And so there are a lot of unorthodox methods. But the orthodox part of medicine is not accepting those things because they feel it's not scientific. Uh, but chronic fatigue does not care whether it is orthodox or not orthodox. At the particular point, I had to start uh, practicing grounding. And when I was doing this in the hospital, a lot of people were looking at me weird. But I didn't care because I know what I'm going through. So you, when you are practicing it or doing it in the community or in your neighborhood, people are looking at you. And if, come to think of it in Africa, we have, there is this notion of ritualism going on. People will think maybe this guy has, is performing a ritualistic uh, <laughs> right. You are walking early in the morning, barefooted on the grass. And people... So... People will carry a lot of misconception, but you've tried a lot of... I've spoken with my doctor, hematologist, about it. Uh, they increased my adiosuria to the highest minimum. So initially, I started taking adiosuria 500 milligrams. Now I'm taking two grams daily. And when I went to the pharmacist to collect it, the pharmacist said, ah, no, 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 this cannot be correct. That This is overdose. And I told him the hematologist prescribed this. And he said he's going to check. And he asked from his other colleagues, and calculated it, and he said, ah, you cannot go beyond this. That this is the highest maximum dose you can go on. And after using it for months, I presented back to the hematologist that no changes. So it's like a lot of trial and errors. So I hope maybe by talking about it the more, you know, I had to publish my experience with chronic fatigue syndrome in a book that I co-authored, The Many Faces and Lives of Sickle Cell. We published it uh, in, 20, in June 2022. Many people with sickle cell disorder to share their own experience. And so when I was reached out to uh, by, I belong to an organization, Amplify Sickle Cell Voices International. And so the, own, the founder of the organization said, oh, let us publish a book about sickle cell disorder, the first of its kind. People from sickle cell warriors from the, and uh, researchers from different parts of the world and continents sharing their experiences. And so I was like, okay, she reached out to me and I said, yeah, I knew I had to publish it. And I'd already surrendered to God that whatever I wants me to do, I would do. So I was thinking, I, I, December 2020, uh, 2021, I was like, I was not in a good mood. I was still struggling with chronic fatigue. Uh, at the particular point, I think was it 18th or 19th, I had my, this migraine like headache for 72 hours, nonstop. It triggered pain crisis frequently. So I had to go and present to the hospital with it. And thank God that opportunity gave me 
uh, provided a platform for the hematologist that saw it to accept that chronic fatigue syndrome or cause in people with sickle cell disorder because I'd seen it before and I described chronic fatigue syndrome to him. And he said, oh, yeah, his narrative was like frequent brain crisis, uh, fre frequent blood breakdown of red blood cells can cause chronic fatigue. But he was not, he didn't understand. So that day when he saw the migraine like headache and I told him I've had it for 22 hours, I've used all the medications that I can use that have been prescribed, none of them work. I won't overuse that, nothing work. And so he said, yes, he has heard about chronic fatigue syndrome before, but he has never had that your chronic with sickle cell disorder, that I'm the first person with sickle cell disorder that will present him with chronic fatigue syndrome. So thank God that opportunity made him to be able to accept. So I believe that consequently, when he hear people with sickle cell disorder describing it, he will not dismiss it, he will be able to list it. So right. when the person reached out to me, I did not even know what I was going to write on. So I was like, oh, maybe I was just going to take maybe my experience about uh, chronic leg ulcer or preapism and publish it. But God, God told me, uh, I want you to write about your experience with chronic fatigue syndrome for the past six years. I have taught you how to be able to write about, about an event or an experience for the chronologically. So I was able to write about my experience with chronic fatigue syndrome for the past six years chronologically from the way, from the day it started. Uh, how I had the experience when I had, when he, I was, I thought I was procrastinating, the, I poured out what out of my body, different experience I published in that book. So I believe talking about it, maybe we, we give the, uh, the medical community and the global community the opportunity to give us the audience and listen that this thing occurs, this thing is right. real. It, okay, let, let me come in there. The, there are certain questions, you know, from what you've been saying that I'd like to ask you. And, and briefly, because of our time, number one, um, how do we sensitize health workers for them to be able to treat sufferers better? Because um, I think a lot of time, because we're not in other people's shoes, we, we, we don't understand how to manage them. But then as, a, as an health worker, I, I feel that you're supposed to be a professional, whether you know you're in my shoe or not, you're supposed to know how to manage my condition. And if you're not being sympathetic or empathetic to my situation, then it becomes really out of place. How do we get health workers to, to I don't know whether to say to be the right or, or do better, you know, where this is concerned, briefly, because I have other questions. We have to educate the health workforce as well. There is limited information even in the medical journals, medical textbooks about sickle cell disorder. So there is a need to educate the medical health worker continuously, and then there is a need to update it because the current information about some things we know about sickle cell disorder are different from some of the things we're experiencing. So, okay, like example, uh, while I was in medical school, up to while I was practicing as a doctor until recently this year, I have always known that the risks of stroke in people with sickle cell disorder only of course in children until last year early this year when they detected when i did mri i, I presented without a um, migraine like headache for some for some two hours and they went to do ct scan mri and it detected i was having silent stroke silent stroke means um asymptomatic stroke now that was not even related to the headache but it was something they detected. And so they said I have to start a stage blood transfusion. That was my first time I have to start a stage blood transfusion. So now in medical journals, you will or medical textbooks, you will not see, you will not see that the risk of stroke in people with sickle cell disorder of course also in adults. And when I had to publish my story online and talk about it on some of the sickle cell groups I belong on Facebook and LinkedIn and the rest, a lot of people were surprised that, oh, I've never heard that stroke is a problem in people with sickle cell disorder as adults so there's a need to update the medical test that we have currently and make them understand that there are still many things about sickle cell disorder that we don't there's a need to con con uh, commit more research more co resources to do more research into it because when we do more research especially qualitative research qualitative research allows us to be able to listen to the experience of the people that have a condition and then when we listen to it we'll be able to document it and engage in more scientific data gathering to be able to accept that yet yeah, these things these hypotheses are true so we need to educate the health, health workforce for instance when i went when i presented with that central hours my headache, 
the doctor I met at the ER was saying, okay, uh, I'll put you on pain medications and then you do CT scan and then we we'll wait for the result. And I said, what about intravenous fluid? And he said, you don't need intravenous fluid. I was like, are you kidding me? He's a medical doctor telling me I don't need intravenous fluid. Standard practice while I learned it in medical school. Any patient with sickle cell disorder that are presented with any form of crisis, especially pain crisis, the first thing apart from pain medication is intravenous fluid. And this person is telling me, you don't need it as a doctor. So you need to educate the health workforce so that we can update the current knowledge you have about managing sickle cell disorder. That is the starting point. Right. Okay. So it's, we have a long way to go. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking about the Nigerian health, health sector. Okay. So th this book you, you have written in June 2022 um, for those in Nigeria, because I know, you know, you're, you're not in right Nigeria presently. For those in Nigeria, how have you been able to, you know, to get this book, the information in this book across to them? So that locally it's enhancing lives and changing circumstances, really giving the right influence to those who really need it. Okay. For, uh, for the books I self-published, uh, my life is sickle cell disorder. I like sickle cell anemia. There are places in Nigeria that the hard copy is available. Um, in Abuja, in Lagos, in Port Harcourt, in Ebony State, in Ilori, in uh, Ocean State, and some other places where they are. I'll put it at the, at the link, at the comment section. There are locations where they can be accessible. They can also be accessible on Amazon, on Kala Book, and on Seller. Now, the book I co-authored that we published together, they are only accessible online for now. On Amazon, you can request for the hard copy or the paper pack. Uh, I think it's also available on other online media. Now, it was not my, uh, my, my self-publishing alone. I co-authored with other people. To be able to make it available in Nigeria as hard copy, I think it's something you're working towards, but it will take a while. But we discuss it during the period. And then I think hopefully when it is available for people to be able to have it, not only in Nigeria, but in African countries, as hard copy will make people know about where they can access it. But currently in Amazon and some other online platform, the book is available. And you can request hard copy or you can get the soft copy on those places. Fantastic. Okay, how can somebody who is a sickle cell sufferer or sickle cell warrior, how can such a person live a, a better life, a fulfilling life, you know, a more energetic life, a more influential life, using your own life, you know, maybe your own lifestyle experience, the things you've had to do, eat, and all of that. Does does feeding what's a sickle cell, you know, sufferer eats their lifestyle. Does it have anything to do with how improving it will be to their health or their life? Okay. Um, some of the things I will add is to read about sickle cell disorder. One, read about it. And one of the ways you could get information, adequate information, is go to your hospital. Ideally, for somebody who lives with sickle cell disorder or sickle cell warriors, you need to frequently visit the hospital for your routine clinic because I, uh, you're supposed to be seeing your doctors routinely. Now, because of the nature of the challenges of the health sector in Nigeria, some organizations, sickle cell organizations, have made it possible whereby health, work, health professionals are brought across to them monthly so that they listen to their complaints and then they're able to access free routine medications. One of them is Bula Sickle Cell Foundation in Abuja. Another one is Audrey Sickle Cell Foundation. Another one is Pierce Sickle Cell, uh, Sickle Cell Initiative in Lauren, and many others like that. So you can easily have access to healthcare workers, healthcare professionals that will take information, share the information, and then you'll be able to get access to free medications, the standard medications, uh, folic acid, hydrosuria, and the rest. But for hydrosuria, I always advise, if I personally I don't prescribe any of the medications, I tell them, see your doctors, because for hydrosuria, you cannot, you're not supposed to start using hydrosuria or continue using it without doing tests. Those, the drug is not just 100% safe. And so there are tests you need to do to check up your systems regularly before you use the medications or to continue the medications. So uh, make sure you visit the hospital, see your doctor, then join a support group. 
a Sikusei foundation, a Sikusei club, a Sikusei organization. From there, you hear the stories and experiences of other people living with Sikusei disorder that can inform you and inspire you. Uh, in, in medical uh, uh, medical science, uh, medicine, while I was in medical school, one of the ways that was highlighted of managing chronic diseases, HIV, tuberculosis, cancer, any form of chronic disease, is by joining the support group, apart from other means. And also, people said this, that was also a chronic disorder, can also benefit from that. Though, in the past, emphasis have not been able to place on this. But I think it's very important now, put more emphasis on it, join a support group where people with sickle cell disorder will share their experiences. Uh, I've had people, when I narrated my experience about chronic leg ulcer, that were inspired uh, because they felt, many of them felt depressed and they felt this is how they'll be living for the rest of their life. I, in fact, I was surprised that when I shared my experience, I've had people that can live for more than it. Seven years. And at the end of the day, it went, you know. So, that hearing other people share their experiences and then at the end of the day it disappeared it's, it were cured it's a it's a motivation it's an inspiration and then information about how they manage it so join a support group from that support group you'll be able to hear about other people's experience and then another thing those support groups or organization providers they link you up with their monthly clinics or quarterly clinics or routine clinics whereby you can have access to free medications or subsidized medications and investigations to be able to help you have your uh, medications as you should have it regularly. So those are the things right. that can be done. Right. I, I did ask, um, are, there, are there other things maybe like uh, nut nutrition or nutritional value that one should be adding maybe in food or something like that, maybe for such people to to live, uh, you know, a normal life, so to say, or an enhanced life. Okay. With regards to nutrition, I want to start by drinking fluid. Dehydration is one of the triggers of sickle cell crisis. There are different sickle cell crises. There's the pain crisis, the hemolytic crisis, sequestration crisis, acute chest syndrome, a plastic crisis. And then there are triggers of the crisis. The, uh, dehydration is one of the triggers. Extremes of temperature, infection, stress, either physical or mental stress, acidosis, uh, hypoxia, low oxygen in the body. Those are the triggers of sickle cell crisis. So dehydration, drinking enough fluid regularly. As a, somebody living with sickle cell disorder or as a sickle cell warrior, it is mandatory. It is important and it is required that we drink fluid regularly, more than other people, more than people without sickle cell disorder drink. So routinely, every day you should drink more fluid regularly. It helps to prevent crisis. It helps to, uh, one, one uh, basic way of explaining is that the, uh, the cycling that the red blood cell causes to block blood circulation, it can help to flush it off. So drinking fluid regularly can help to prevent crisis from occurring. Then uh, there is no taboo in regards of scientifically, what food you should eat or what food you should not eat. Eat every healthy food. Uh, for managing chronic diseases, they are advised, either heart problem, kidney problem, and also sickle cell disorder. Eat more of vegetables, fresh leafy vegetables. Eat more of fresh fruits because all of this is, helps to build your immunity. The vitamins and trace elements there help to build your immunity. Sickle cell disorder is a condition that reduces the immunity. So once the immunity is reduced, you are prone to infection and any other kinds of problems. One of the ways you can help to build your immunity is by, you know, eating uh, fresh leafy vegetables, eating fresh fruits regularly. And then any food that is healthy, any food that every other person eats, you can eat it. The only thing is ensure proper food hygiene, ensure proper personal hygiene. But there is no limitation to that I know scientifically, medically speaking, to the kind of food you can eat. But the only emphasis will place on drinking more fluid regularly. And this is one way I used to explain it. Personally, I don't like drinking water more. So, but I like drinking a lot of things that is sweet. So what I do is uh, I get uh, juice and I mix equal volume of juice with equal volume of water. And so by that, I can satisfy my desire to take a lot of sweet things regularly and also meet the requirement to drink more fluid regularly. So by that, I've learned to understand that as a sickle cell warrior, you should know what works for you know how it works for you, and then make it work for you. Hmm. 
Okay, before we go, my last question, I want to believe. I think this, this is going to be my last question to you tonight. Um, with all of those things you've gone through, your experiences, what would be your take on, on those who, who are in love with sickle cell sufferance? Or um, how do we, where does sickle cell, or what role does sickle cell play where a relationship, love relationship that would lead to marital bliss or lasting relationship? Where, where does sickle cell fall into or how should we manage such relationship and sickle cell? Okay, for a marital relationship, to prevent sickle cell, one of the areas is to concentrate on marital relationship. Uh, once you know you are genotypically not compatible, you are not advised to marry each other. Uh, then, so you have to understand what genotype, com uh, genotype compatibility is all about. Uh, for AS, we are carriers, AS, AS, uh, they have, you are not compatible genotypically because there is a tendency that for AS, AS marrying one, each other, there is this myth that uh, in four children, one will be sickle cell anemia. That is not true. That is a myth, which is a form of misinformation. This is how it occurs. This is how it's inherited. For each pregnancy, it's about probability and chance. For each pregnancy, there is a 25% chance when AS, AS marry, there's a 25% chance that the pregnancy can be SS. There's a 25% chance that the pregnancy can be AA, or do I say 50% chance that the pregnancy can be AS. It is for each pregnancy. So a family that has three children may be lucky that all of them are AA, or they may be unlucky that all of them are SS. Because it is chance, it is probability, you cannot predict it. So that's why it's advisable. ASAS is not compatible. ASSS not compatible. ASSC not compatible. AASS compatible. AAAS compatible. But anytime you have ASAS, ASSS, ASSC, or AS sickle cell plus thalassemia, they are not compatible. One, that is one part of it to prevent uh sickle cell disorder from occurring or from um, 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 occur, uh, occurring the more secondly um people living with sickle cell disorder that are married or in a relationship or in a family um as much as possible i will say it's not easy for because from my experience i will say um it's not easy to talk to people about it because you need to be able to identify personally and i've shared my experience with other people and i've listened to other people with this other, and i've observed that the pattern is the same it's not easy for you to be able to share your secrets with people or tell people you know there's this complaint normal com frequent complaint that when we are going to bring crisis we don't tell people and you know your family members siblings or loved ones are like you don't you are just hiding you just go through it alone well, come? because it's not easy for you to look get somebody that will listen genuinely care uh, because when you are having pain crisis your mind is messed up and that's why i use a pregnant woman in acute labor well, you know when you are in that acute labor your mind is messed up because i've heard of women or i've seen women who are in that period and they were cursing their husband saying a lot of negative things and then if you if you talk that as good they are, you'll be wrong because it is not them, it is what the labor pain is doing to them. And so that is the same way it occurs with sickle cell disorder. You are, when you're having pain crisis, you are irritable, you can be irritable, and so you cannot trust that the people that will be around you can bear and can tolerate your irritability. Secondly, you, you can be frustrating or you can be misbehave. You don't even know because the way the, the pain crisis messes up your mind, you don't, you don't, all reasoning is gone. So you are not. We are not sure. Then other thing is you don't want to, you don't, most of the time, you don't want to see ourselves as a burden, a burden to others. So maybe somebody is with you and is like, oh, you are again having this pain. That alone can traumatize your mind. And you just make up your mind that anytime I'm having pain crisis, I will not call this person again. Because when you're having pain crisis again, and you want to call the person, your mind will be, there are a lot of things going through your mind. And your mind will be tormenting you that, are you all right? This, this person that did the same thing to you the last time, you think it is, your opinion about people that make people change. Oh, you, so 
The, and once your mind is stressed, it can prolong the brain crisis, it can worsen the brain crisis. So as much as possible, when you're in pain crisis, you don't want anything to stress your mind. So you need to be around people that understand you, uh, people, the people, people living with you that love you must understand what it is. You must understand that or the pain crisis messes up your mind. They must understand that there are a lot of things about school said disorder that you don't know. At times, you can't explain it. How your body is behaving, you can't explain it. And then there's this issue of sudden, suddenness, whereby all of a sudden you are feeling fine. You've um, agreed that you are going to go out with other people, maybe to visit somebody, go out to do something, go out for an event together. And when it is time to go out for the event, suddenly you start having a pain crisis or suddenly you're having chronic fatigue or suddenly you're having migraine headache and you can't go. And you're like, are you all right? And you're like, ah, oh, sorry, please, I can't go. I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling fine. And they're like, but you've been playing around all the while. And suddenly, you're not feeling fine. What is, so they will find it difficult to believe you. But you cannot explain it yourself because that is how it occurs. Suddenly, a dead people's sickle cell disorder does not take permission from you. It doesn't even respect your activities. It doesn't even respect your plans. I've had instances when uh, at work, I've planned that, okay, we are going to go for this, do this, that, this. And at the point of going out to do those things, pain crisis started suddenly. And I have to tell my colleagues, please go ahead or let us postpone it. And thank God they had to understand. So if, you are, if your family members, anybody that loves you, that's living with you, have to understand those things to be able to support you. That it is not your fault. One, they cannot use it to describe who you are because when they start using it to describe who you are, you just crawl back to your shell. You are dealing with something you don't understand yourself. You are dealing with something you can't explain. And then um, somebody is not patient to tolerate it with you. Or somebody is asking you, you should be able to explain that. You're like, I can't explain it because I don't even know how to explain it. And the more they stress you, the more mental stress, the more the pain, it can trigger a pain crisis. You don't want that. So uh, they have to understand that there are things about school said disorder that you may experience that even medical journals, medical literature does not, does not know about. And so you, we are, you, are, you are confused because you're like, where, where can I get information about this? Nobody knows about this. And they must be willing to bear with you when you are looking for because I know, I, imagine you are going to a problem that, medically speaking, there's no place you can get information about how to detect what you are going to. Medically speaking, there's no place you can get information about how to manage it. And so you are confused. It brings that confusion. And when I listen to many people that describe their experiences with chronic fatigue syndrome from different countries, US, UK, Australia, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Zambia, and all, all countries in the world, the first thing you experience when you are having that chronic fatigue is confusion. It's the same pattern. Because you are confused, what kind of fatigue is this? You, we have never had a fatigue like this. Normally when you feel tired and you sleep and you wake up, you feel refreshed. Now you, you are feel feeling weaker. Yeah. yeah, you feel confused that what is going on? I don't understand this. And if you try to push yourself, it can trigger a crisis. And I tell, as I told you, it triggered a pain crisis for me. And so you, are, you feel more confused. So those are part of the things you just... You know, you, if somebody loves you, you just have to make them understand that. I don't understand this. And, and even when you are having it, you can't even explain it. And they should just be able to. In fact, sometimes when you're having that con, um, experiences, you don't want them anybody around you. And they are insisting, no, I want to be around you. And you're like, no, I don't want anybody. Because your mind is messed up. And they could just be patient. That thing. So, so, I, I, sorry. I, I, um, okay. Uh, Dr. Dr. Way, when okay. someone, because... I'm thinking when somebody is going through pain, we, we want to be around them to see what we can do, you know, ensure that they're fine and they don't want us to be around them. How do we, how do we relate to that? How do we manage that? Um, okay. Um, I think one thing is, like I can say, I will not, I'm not going to put blame on anybody um, because with the pain crisis, it comes differently. Uh, recently, last year, I had a nasty pain crisis that messed up my mind. And I got back, I got to work, I was, got to work, I was irritated, I was hopeless, I, was, I felt bad about everything. But it, was, it has been like almost years that I've had that kind of experience where a pain crisis will mess up my mind. And so I felt, I thought I had overcome this thing. And it's like, men have not overcome it. It's like, is it, can I get to a point where I will say the messing up of the mind that comes with pain crisis, you've overcome it. So we have that to deal with, you can't predict. And I think one problem is that there is medical literature or medical science does not 
has not been able to help us to identify the mental problems we deal with as coastal warriors and so how to manage those things. Maybe if you can get information about that to tell us these are the do's and don'ts, these are the steps or guidelines to deal with, be able to help you deal with this mental issue. So it is like a self discovery for myself. Uh, the only thing I could just say is please bear with them, please bear with us, please be patient. When, um, when we say we don't want you around us, just understand. It is not we talking. After a while, we may want you around us. And then give right. us time to be able to manage it ourselves because it gets to a point whereby, I, I, I believe it gets to a point whereby you will not manifest those messed up characters, those irritability again because maybe you should be able to have it control, able to control it. And, but hopefully I pray by God's grace, we'll get to that point. Amen. All right. I have the uh, Rita, <coughs> my very dear friend, uh, the GM of Hot FM, right on the feed. Hello, Queen Rita, how are you doing? She says, people still don't understand what warriors go through. And Dr. Adishan Aldoni says, psychosocial uh, impact of the disease needs to be considered. What do you say about that? Or what do you think she's trying to say? She says, psychosocial impact of the disease needs to be, um, you know, considered. Okay. Um... Now, as I said, sickle cell disorder is a disorder that affects your physical body, affects your mind, affects your social environment as well, because it's financially expensive to manage it. It is expensive to manage it. And then if the family is not financially buoyant, it can be a big problem. It can be a challenge. And then especially in countries where we don't have strong health systems. It is very expensive to manage sickle cell disorder. Psychologically, it, it, it comes with a lot of psychological problems, anxiety, depression, man, uh, aggression, and all those stuff. I remember when I had chronic leg ulcer, my first experience, I, I got at the point because I kept dressing the wound, dressing the wound, and the base of the wound kept appearing white as if it was not healing at all. And so at a particular point, I felt, man, maybe they're going to amputate my leg. I was mentally disturbed. So after, after it, uh, it, it was cured, it left, and then I had a second experience. I was working in a hospital then, and the nurses there were dressing it for me. By then, I, I, because of the first experience, I was confident that, yeah, it would go. And so at some point, the nurses were asking me because they keep dressing it alternate days, every two days, and no changes. And they were asking me, doctor, are you sure this thing is going to heal? Are you sure this thing is ever going to go? And I was the one encouraging them that, yeah, it will, because I've had it before, and I showed them the spot. This is where the first experience. So psychologically, it can be depressing, or you're having priapism, and then you've done everything. At times, I've had somebody that had to go and present in the hospital, and the hospital sent him back home because they could not manage it. So where does it go to? So it affects you psychologically, socially. Another thing, social uh, aspect, sorry, I just have to talk. <coughs> Another thing socially is I will talk about is the, when I had a um, bedwetting. There is this so, uh, cultural belief about bedwetting there. So when I was bedwetting, because of this cultural belief that, oh, when the child uh, washes his beddings outside, the yes. shame stops him or her from bedwetting. So anytime I bedwet, my, I grew up in a family whereby my parents may ensure that we read a lot. So my father was placed much emphasis on reading. So every afternoon from 2 or 3 till maybe 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. we read. Then maybe, uh, by 6 p.m. we go and play outside. So those days that I did bedwet and I had to spread my beddings outside. Once it's time to go and play, I will not go. And then my father will ask me, why, why are you going? Why are you not going? Why don't you want to read? And I will lie that, oh, because I want to read. I love reading. And so my father would be like, oh, very good. But the truth is, no, I wasn't. It's not because I loved reading. It was because I was ashamed to go out where I meet yeah. my neighbors playing. And then they would ask, ah, who is the owner of that bed? Is, ah, or to tall or stuff like that. So that shame made me stay back indoor to be reading while other people were going out to play. And my father felt, oh, my son loves reading a lot. It was not because I loved reading. I was just ashamed to go out. So, you see, that's, that's another social complication or social consequences or social side to uh, sickle cell disorder. And then the picker, when you are eating sand, 
and when the urge yes. comes on you it is uncontrollable you just go and so i you cannot control it and i i believe it is very important that the medical committee help us to be able to understand how to deal with these things psychologically because there is a psychological aspect <sighs> to it right Okay, Dr. Odole, I, I'm almost feeling like bringing you up, but I, I'm not so sure whether you're prepared, you know, wherever you are. Dr. Odole is, um, is uh, you know, a physiotherapist. She's an associate professor at the College of Medicine, University of Ibadan, and she is the HOD of uh, the physiotherapy department right there. And I will constantly and continuously say, I had been, uh, she has been a blessing to me. She and the people at the, at the department um, have been a blessing to me because I, I have suffered from some neurological um, pain, you know, and I, I still go through it, but it's not as bad as it used to be. I'm off drugs, you know, every now and then, yes, you know, the spasm, I get it every, even as I'm sitting every day every time but you know thanks to um god giving consultants like dr odele and uh, she says thank you lady gwen and dr way for this awesome uh, you know conversation she also says sufferers and warriors of um, sickle cell disease should be allowed as stakeholders in the management of the disease i i i think so and that's what uh, dr warrior is also saying that when you know those the scientists or those who have been given the authorization to do scientific findings and research you know should also be able to uh, accumulate or um, gather the experiences of sufferers you know as a way of uh, looking at the spectrum and seeing how that affects you know sickle cell disease generally and I, and it's really the 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 essence of you know people's testimony that you know we begin to find uh, answers to to this disease and indeed you know we say stop discrimination against sickle cell disease and yes and that should be our slogan for every day of our lives nobody deserves to be discriminated upon no matter what else they're going through as we wrap up you know with this conversation uh, Dr Owey. What would be your last word to sufferers, to um, warriors out there, to uh, maybe the media, the health workers, you know, the health system, the, the relative, the loved ones? I know you've, you've, you've touched upon every, every one of these things, but as a last passing word, what would, what would that be? Okay, um, one, the medical community and the entire community should understand that um, having sickle cell disorder in our body or in our blood does not mean the absence of God. So it will stop that discrimination that people attach to it, especially within the religious and cultural uh, circle. Then to sickle cell warriors, caregivers and the rest, my uh, admonition is that by the grace of God, there are no limitations in life except for the limits you allow in your mind. So do not let sickle cell disorder limit you. You may have sickle cell disorder, but don't let sickle cell disorder have you. So by that, you can achieve a great life, do great things in life, contribute to your part and make an impact in our world. Thank you very much. Don't let sickle cell You're win welcome. over you. And um, I remember something recently, a video, you know, I saw from uh, uh, Reverend from Adejimo. She was saying, your life will not be wasted. You are here. Even when doctor says you have ovarian cancer, you have this and that, even if it's true, you are right here this moment. And right here, right now, you are still living. So what would you do with that life that you have right here, right now? So Dr. Weyo, you are here at this point in time, even though managing um, you know, all of these challenges, but you're here right now. And I thank God for your life because you're an influence to other people. You're sharing these messages. It's, it's a great message and it reminds me of what the, the book, the Holy Book says about 
going, going, us going into the world and to evangelize, to preach the word in Judea, Samaria, in the uttermost part. This is a message in itself, and this is a call, you know, upon your life in itself. And I thank God for it. And I thank God that you're hitting the call. And I pray that for each day, each passing day, God will bring you the release and relief in every sphere of your life. And um, it Amen. will not be in vain. You know, all of these challenges will not be in vain. And truly, truly, Jehovah God will glorify himself in all of it. He's already taking the glory because as many people that have heard the story and as many that would hear it, their lives are already changed because it's mind blowing. I mean, it's it's making me to be a bit sober, you know. On let's talk with Lady Gwen tonight, and so um, as many that would keep hearing these messages, you know, in Europe, in in UK, US, in Nigeria, in Africa, their lives will continually be changed because you are a living testimony. You are a great warrior. And never ever stop. Even no matter Amen. how this old darkness clouds your mind, never stop. Never Amen. stop. Know, know that you're Amen. you are the Moses in such a time like this. All right. Thank, thank you, you Papa thank Bloom. You thank you, Papa Bloom Publisher says thank you, Lady Gwen and Dr. Oye. This has been very informative. Dr. Uh, Oye, God will continue to grant you strength to inspire more. Amen. I do say amen. Thank you to amen. everyone. No, thank you. I, I I see you all. I see you all. You know, some other people are just joining. Dr. Odole, you've been quite so attentive. Thank you to everybody who's joined this feed and to those who will be watching, you know, later on YouTube, on you know, any other platform and putting this information out there. Thank you very much. Mama Dom Thank you, says Dr. Way is a great warrior. Indeed, I'm telling you, when you go through pain, pain has a way. When you keep saying, messes up with your mind, I understand it. I understand it, really. Pain is crazy. Pain, it paralyzes the mind, body, and soul. It's, it takes you out of your normal. It, it does pain. Pain makes people to commit suicide. Because yeah, you just want yeah. to end it and, and just pack it up and, and just have that peace of mind and just end it. So if you've not ended it, despite the pain you're going through, oh my goodness, you are a champion and you are God's battle, you know, in such a time like this. You are such a, an amazing testimony. I, I don't know what word to describe it again, but you're an amazing testimony that you're going through all of those things and you've not killed yourself, oh my goodness, you are such an amazing testimony, a, a wonder of God's grace. And I thank God for your life. Keep on shining, thank keep you. on thriving. Mm -hmm. Don't give up, Amen. don't give up. Keep thank sharing you. your story as, as many that will give you the room, the platform. Um, keep sharing the story, keep proclaiming. You know, like, like John the Baptist in the wilderness, who we was just shouting all around the place, mm -hmm. pave ye the way, pave, keep shouting it to the rooftop anyway. Every Tom Dick and Ari and Nkechi and Ngozi that cares to listen, even if they don't care to listen, keep proclaiming it. Mm -hmm. One day, you know, as, as you do so, you will be changing life. You'll be inspiring someone to get up from mm -hmm. their sick bed, you know, and to push on. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Right. Okay, so that's it. And let's talk with Lady Gwen till another edition, another time. Please stay safe. God bless you. Vote the right candidates. Get your PVC. Uh, get into the right conversation. Let your, let, your, let your senses, you know, help you to vote 2023. We can't go on like this in Nigeria. The health system is terrible. Everything is just upside down, you know. But we are here this moment right now, and God be with you. I, I am Lady Gwen, and uh, it's been great on Let's Talk with Lady Gwen. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.